happening in here today, and I'm looking at the, the, the skyline here in, in Kansas City. It brings back a lot of memories for me because we used to sell candy here a lot when we were kids. And then when I moved out, I worked for a law firm in, in Kansas City for the better part of a year until the uh, FBI showed up one day and arrested the senior partner. <laughs> <laughs> and then I found out I was working for one of the top mob lawyers in Kansas City. <laughs> so, a lot of memories here. One specific memory, one specific memory is um, not long after I left, well, when I was living here in Kansas City, I was, uh, I was with a group of friends and we drove up to uh, a Liberty Memorial. At the time, it was called Fag Circle. Does anybody remember that? Yeah. Yes. And uh, we went up there and we tortured some some of the uh, kids congregated there. I remember one of the guys in the car was like, threw a soda out and hit one of a couple of them that were kissing at the time. So I was very much involved in the ideas that that I grew up with. Um, I'm thinking it as I'm watching what was going on here this morning how amazing it is that I grew up in the environment that I did. Spent a lot of that time here in this, in this city, and this has happened. This is amazing to me. It's um, quite an emotional experience as well. So I got here this morning and they handed out these, these uh, name tags, and, and I, put, I wrote mine up, and, and Sarah got upset with me because what I wrote, she wrote her own. <laughs> says, named great. <laughs> I would just change that to grateful, and that would be okay. But I had written on my name tag, Nimrod. Anybody remember familiar with the term Nimrod, or the, the character in the Bible, Nimrod? Yeah. Because I was in a, uh, I was in the, the uh, O'Hare Airport in Chicago after Apostacon a year, a year ago. That would be 2013. And the Falcons were playing football. I was in, in a bar having a beer while I waited for the, the plane to arrive or to take off. And um, the running back made a play, he picked up 15 or 20 yards. Suddenly over my left shoulder, somebody bellowed out, oh my God, did you see that? And I turned around and this fellow, like, I didn't know who he was. I don't know if he was even talking to me, but he, I was the closest to him. And then he said, you know why that happened? Because of Nimrod. And I thought, oh shoot, we got a problem here. <laughs> Um, what he meant, he said, the Bible says that Nimrod was a great warrior and he was raised up and then he was cast down and then, and then he would be raised again before he was finally destroyed. What he meant was the black race was hated by God and that they were once strong and then he cast them down. That's the slavery time. And then he allowed them to be raised back up and that's the running back making 15 yards time. <laughs> And then eventually they're all going to be destroyed because God. Um, so it's not lost yet, folks. It's, there's a lot of that crazy thing that's still going on out there. Anyway, so Nimrod, for me, I went and looked it up because I always research stuff so I know what I'm talking about or at least pretend I know what I'm talking about. The Bible, there's, a, there's several schools of thought, but the thing that struck me is that the, the word Nimrod actually means um, or includes in its meaning rebellion, rebellious. And I, for years, struggled with that term rebellious because of what it meant, the implications, the fear, and, and the guilt that it, that it uh, created in me when, I, when someone directed that term at me. Until one day I realized, after I got past the fear and the guilt, and I realized that rebellion in the face of my father's theology was the only moral option. So I, I take that name back and I accept that, that I was rebellious because that's the way we should be in the face of evil. So that's, that's all my housekeeping. So now I'm going to try to pretend like I'm able to talk. <laughs> um, usually there's like a stand. And now I have to look down. Oh well. So in 1991, the world was introduced to my family. My father. Uh, Fred Phelps gathered with uh, several members of the church, primarily my family members, at the corner of uh, 10th Street and Gates Boulevard. And thank you very much. Boy, <laughs> <laughs> Everybody 
remember that movie, uh, Shark Tales, when the, when the shark let the little shrimp go. That's why the, the father brought the shrimps into the shark team to teach him how to be, to be mean and eat things. And the shark couldn't do it, so he sent the shrimp out inside the, the door of the ship that was sunk. And the, uh, the little shrimp turned to him and said, You're a good person. Thank you for that. <laughs> Placed ideas on 
pedestals of truth. And in that process, I came to accept that many of my ideas, my truths, rested on the single assumption that a book was holy, God-inspired, simply because the book said it was. And I realized that that assumption failed and many others would fall with it, as well as the beliefs that were sustained by them. Now in that process, I came across a passage in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 that says, Now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three, and the greatest of these is love. I'm sure most of you have heard that before. Three human characteristics wanted above all else, cherished by the believer. Like so many other ideas in the Bible, I want to challenge that idea. One discovery that masked the morality of the world I lived in, discovered and reflected, or exposed to greater truth than we know. First of all, there's hope, a rather benign characteristic, in my opinion, reflecting a state of waiting and yearning for a desirable outcome once action has been taken. But what of faith? Defined as belief not sustained by logical proof or material evidence. To challenge that idea, I'd like to tell you a story. Lisa Frost was a young lady who grew up in the community that we lived in, in Southern California, the base of Saddleback Mountain. She had recently graduated from Boston University and had made plans to return to her home, spend some time with her family and friends before she traveled to the, the Bay Area to start her new career. As chance would have it, Lisa had been booked on the second plane that flew into the World Trade Center. America had been attacked and nearly 3,000 lives were lost. And nearly every human in America had been profoundly impacted by that act. 19 hijackers had flown four airplanes into buildings and the ground. And likely, one of the last thoughts on all their minds was of the reward they would receive for their actions. And the only certainty that the reward they would receive that they would receive that reward was a certainty that they held by faith. A certainty not sustained by logical proof and material evidence. So I reached out to Lisa's family and I worked with her father as he prepared for her memorial service. I had the opportunity to spend time alone with him talking to him and I watched him as he struggled with this possible loss. He carried a folder around with him he would, at the drop of a hat, open it, and he would pull out the letter that, that uh, President Bush had sent him. And he would pull out the letter that Governor Gray Davis of California had sent him. And he tried to make this all worth it. Through the tears, I watched him struggle to make sense of that senseless loss. And I watched my family, and I watched my friends and the community and somewhere in that process it, occurred, process, it occurred to me that we were making the same mistake. We were turning to our faith to respond to this horrid act of faith that had been visited upon us. And in that moment it occurred to me that perhaps faith was one of the greatest threats that mankind faces today. Now I can tell you folks, I've said that on several occasions in my talks, and that is not a popular opinion or a popular idea. But you see, we live our lives based on ideas. Ideas fall on a continuum between absolute true and absolutely false. Ideas inform and instruct our lives and those ideas that best reflect reality should be the ones that inform us the most. That's why we debate. When ideas proper and it enters the marketplace of ideas. It's discussed, challenged, adjusted, or discarded, depending on its ability to accurately inform us of the true nature of things. But faith sidesteps this crucial accountability process. Faith says there are some ideas that should not be subject to this rigorous process. And faith protects itself from legitimate scrutiny by crying blasphemy.
Now the reality is that the vast majority of people manage to reconcile their faith ideas such that they minimize harm to others. But that's not where the problem lies in my opinion. I believe the risk is that when there's a broad acceptance of an idea, in this case the broad acceptance of the idea of faith, it gives power and legit legitimacy to those who would use faith to harm others deliberately or not. To demonstrate that, I'd like to tell you another story, clarify it a little bit more. 22-month-old Michael Hillman was playing in the backyard of his home in Pennsylvania. As he scampered about, he stepped on a piece of glass hidden in the grass. His cries ushered his mother, Susan, and her love for Michael compelled her to call her husband, Dean, home. Dean re returned home, cleaned the wound, bound it, and comforted his, his little boy. And then several hours passed and the dressing on the wound began to see blood. Once again, love motivated the parents to seek additional medical help. And that's where faith took over. Faith advised them to contact Pastor Charles Reinert, leader of the Faith Tabernacle, where they worshiped. And when Pastor Reinert arrived at their home, Faith once again informed his actions. Specifically, Faith in a passage in James where the God of the universe instructed him to anoint with oil and pray over the sick, assuring them that the prayers of a righteous man avails much and that those prayers would raise Michael from his sick bed. So Pastor Reinhardt anointed and prayed. And Michael Hewman led. More time passed, and Michael's condition worsened. Additional elders were called. Additional prayers were made, and additional blood, additional blood drained from the little boy's foot. As his color turned gray and his breathing shallowed, it was love that etched the worry lines on his parents' face. But it was faith that bound them to their unaccountable method of healing. And it was faith in the end that closed little Michael's eyes forever. Nothing, not even the death of a child, can drive faith into the arms of accountability. But the tragedy doesn't end there, folks. In a horrific example of my earlier point that it's the broad acceptance of an idea that creates the harm. When the people of Pennsylvania petitioned for justice, they ran into this language in the Pennsylvania Child Abuse Statute. If upon investigation the county agency determined that a child has not been provided needed medical or surgical care because of seriously held beliefs, and I underline the next four words, of the child's parents, the child should not be deemed to be physically or mentally abused. Again, ancient wisdom, now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three. And the greatest of these is love. My challenge to that wisdom, faith is not a virtue. But what of love? Bertrand Russell, the great British philosopher, when he was in his later years, was, had done an interview. And he was asked in the interview what it was that he learned in life and would like to pass on to the, the new generations. And he said, there's two things I'd like to say, one intellectual and one moral. The intellectual thing I would like to say is, whenever you are considering a matter or philosophy, look only and solely at what are the facts. Never let yourself be diverted either by what you would like to believe or what you think would be beneficial for society if it was believed. But look only and solely at the facts. That's the intellectual thing I would like to say. The moral thing I would like to say, I would like to say that love is wise and hatred is foolish. Mr. Russell speaks of the morality of love. Is faith moral? I don't see how. 
At best, faith is a failed arbiter of truth. In rejecting accountability, faith allows immorality to slip in. Faith failed us on 9-11. And faith failed the fundamental test of morality in protecting the well-being of a defenseless child. I mentioned earlier that this passage comes from 1 Corinthians 13. There's other passages in that Bible or in that chapter that we're more familiar with. It goes like this. Love is long-suffering and is kind. Love does not envy. It's not puffed up. Love isn't unseemly. It's not selfish. It's not easily provoked. And it doesn't dwell on evil thoughts. It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoice in the truth. Rejoices in the truth, ladies and gentlemen. Love bears all things and endures all things, and love never fails. When you leave today, I'd like you to leave with this question on your mind. Moving forward, what matrix will you use to determine morality in your life? Faith, hope, and love. Hope doesn't really address that question. Faith, refusing accountability, I believe fails it. So these three, I would argue that the only moral filter is love. Thank you all very much. the argument 
for continuing on with ideas that we just simply cannot um, prove. The argument is similar to what I've heard before. Well, religion does a lot of good, and atheism does a lot of bad, which, you know, that's a different argument. But the point is, in my mind, for instance, uh, the Catholic Church issue with uh, the way they were treating all those young boys. Just because they do good also, and just because there are other things that do bad also, is not a justification for allowing that particular evil to stand and to continue on. If we got rid of that, then we deal with the next thing that comes along that does harm to, to the humans, the ideas that, that harm us. I don't think it's justification for hanging on to stuff that has utterly failed us. Do you still have contacts with your siblings? The ones that are there are not allowed to, and because uh, they get kicked out as well. And at this point, they, they wouldn't want to. So unless it's a uh, some kind of a, of a uh, some kind of a protest or something like that, um, I know I don't have contact with them. What would you suggest as the best way to approach um, de-escalating things with the Westboro Baptist Church? What's the best way to oppose their work? It seems like we don't really want to meet them at that level of anger, for sure. I, I, I've said it before, I think that the best thing to do is when you're in a situation that they're going to come somewhere and they're going to put that message out there and, and, and effectively cause harm for the people in that community or, or certain people in that community, the best response is to, to turn that around and deliberately make something positive out of it. And I've seen a lot of communities do that and have very powerful impact. And I think in general that's what we should always do when we're facing, um, when we're facing evil. So do you think counter-protests and uh, human shields work against the Westboro Baptist Church? Uh, somewhat. I don't, to me, that, that doesn't go quite as far as I'd like, like to go. We'll raise funds based on the amount of time that they're there. People will agree to donate a dollar per minute that they're there. And then that money will go to uh, some resource within the community that supports those very people that were being attacked. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a more proactive and effective way of responding to it. Hey, hi, Roy Edmund. I'm a freelance photographer working for the Kansas City Star this morning. Uh, thanks for coming, and thanks for allowing me to photograph you. I have a couple questions. Number one, um, could you expound just a bit on how it was how it was for you personally to make this what must have been an extremely difficult decision to leave family, church, friends, and number two, um, did you have any second thoughts? Let me answer number two first, because that's easy one. Yes. <laughs> um, so, if, if I could paint the frame of mind that I was in when I left, it was primarily the violence and the message that I had heard and, and embraced about who I was as a person that was the, the primary motivator. At that, at that time that I left, I had accepted my father's theology. By and large, it was intact. And I, I left there. I remember the, the few months ahead of me leaving, um, going through this mental process of saying that I was, uh, basically I knew that my father, that I was going, my father was correct, I was evil, and I was going to die and go to hell. But he also taught that Christ was going to return sometime around the year 2000. So I did the math in my head. I said, okay, so the sixth grade of one will get me 42, and then I'll deal with that when I'm 42. Meanwhile, I'm going to go out and live life on my terms because staying here just keeps reminding me that I'm evil and that I'm going to hell. So that was, that, that's where I was. Um, so to answer the, the second question, I had, uh, I had doubts and second thoughts almost constantly after I left there. I, I was able for the first five years or so roughly, to push that into the background and live the life I wanted to live. And then when my children were born, um, I ran into a brick wall because 
the emotion and the, the impact of having a, a little human being in your hands and the, the, um, the love that you feel for that, that human. And then trying to reconcile how someone else could, could feel that way of, about a human and then treat them the way that my father treated us. That was, that was kind of the simple moment. Things started to fall apart and I started to have to do a lot of, of uh, reading and, uh, and uh, psychology and, and that kind of stuff. I went through years of, of counseling to try to uh, address those issues. But in the midst of all that, I'm constantly challenging or, or coming back to, to my mind, even if I think a thought that was different from what my father taught us, that was evidence that, that Satan was at, at work in my heart. So it was a constant challenge, and there was constant second guessing and, and doubting throughout that process for probably the better part of 20 years. Uh, 
effective techniques for teaching kids the love of God. And then he would go back to the, the physical, and at that point the skin is so tight that when he hit you again, they would split and it would bleed. So that was, and then if he didn't have the mat off him, or he was mad enough, he would just use his fists. And he had, I remember he had a glove that, um, we had one of those, one of those hanging things that you punch. Punch your back, yeah. <laughs> Actually we had about 15 of those. No, but, um, and he had a glove to, for when he was using it, and the glove had a bar sewn into the, the palm of it. And he would put that on sometimes, and that's what he would use to, when he was hitting the kid. Um, he, would, he would kick us. I remember one of, his, one of the most effective things in his mind was he would grab, grab the child by the arms and swing them towards him and then drive his knee up into their stomach repeatedly. So this is the behavior. This is the conduct. But the Bible justified it. So, was it systemic? Was it the other adults? Doing the same thing or no, 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 in that sense, no. But he did require, as as he got tired, as he got older and got tired, then he started requiring my older brother, Mark and Fred, to administer. And of course, as you would imagine, they're not going to be quite as zealous about it. And so he fixed that problem pretty quickly by every time they failed to administer with the same zeal and intensity, he would beat them. And that was how he ran things. He was very black and white on a lot of those things. So. Um, maybe you find this, because um, we were talking about like, just kind of presenting the facts of people, and then maybe you can talk about the facts of the kid or child. You said that he used the children. I'm just curious. What age you Oh, okay. Well, they, um, my mother admits that he was, um, in fact, he got in trouble with the congregation early on because. He, at one point, because Fred Jr., when he was a baby, an infant, wrapped in a blanket and was laying on the floor in the church and was crying too much, and he went over and kicked him across the floor. It was a waxed floor, so I don't know how much damage would have been done. But So he, was, he really had no limitations on it, but those kind of beatings typically were administered to the kids who were some, somewhere between the age of, of 7 and, and 17. Hi, Nate. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> um, can you talk for just a minute? I know um, everywhere you go when you tell your story, people are so compelled. Um, and, and I'd like you to just talk for just a second about why completing this documentary and getting your story out you know, throughout mass media, you know, why, why is that so important to you? And, and what difference do you see that making in the broader community outside of the secular focus? Yeah, that's a good question. I started talking, the first time I gave a speech was in 2009 in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And I was speaking at the American Atheist Conference. And I was nervous about speaking at an Atheist Conference. Not that I was afraid I was going to be mugged or anything, but I, even though I was a de facto atheist at that point in my life, the, the word atheist was ugly still. In fact, I was telling the story the other night that I walked by uh, table with books after I gave my talk and I saw this book that said the God virus and I looked at it and I looked at the picture and I thought to myself well that's not very nice <laughs> and of course I met Daryl later <laughs> um, okay but the point the point is that when I got back home I was amazed at how many people contacted me didn't have anything to do with religion, had everything to do with violence, had everything to do with that sense, that feeling of being different, of being um, shunned by the community. And many of them were LGBT um, people. And a broad spectrum of people, they all related on some level to the story that I told. And I realized that this was a bigger story than just my journey from religion. And so I started talking about that. And as I got more and more into the process of becoming an advocate for the LGBT community, I started learning more and more about how, how much they suffered, how many of them were killing themselves. And that, to me, is what this, this documentary is all about. Um, 
I've tried a lot of different strategies. I've tried to figure out the best way to be most effective in changing the minds of people. And I've just determined that the best way is to change their hearts, to reach their hearts. And if we can do that, then we can get them to at least consider the possibility that there's a better way to do this, a better way to think about it. And that's what I, I, I want this documentary for. I want, that's what I want it to do, is, is let people feel the reality that these people live and maybe change their hearts. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's my that's my hope. Um, the, the question was, do, now that my father's passed, do I think that the church will die? I hope it does. Um, I, I can't predict what will happen. I know that a lot, like I said, a lot of the Yemen's are leaving. I would hope that at some point that might be an impetus for the thing to start to fall apart. It all depends on how much the nine that are still there have internalized this and embraced it for their made it their own. Um, I think some I think to some degree it'll start to fall apart. I don't know if it will if it will go away anytime soon though. I'm sorry, that's the second question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, I can't wait a minute. <laughs> and then at the end of the her question was, was Fred abused as a child, and how was Fred raised? Did he break from his normal family teachings and start this, or, or how, did, how did it internalize in Fred where he was passing it on to you? It's a good question, and the, the, the honest answer is I, I, I don't know for sure. I can give you insight into his childhood. He was he was a classmate valedictorian. He was a um, Golden Glove boxer. He was an Eagle Scout. He had an appointment to West Point. Um, but he also, according to folks that, the, that he grew up with, he also had this tendency to, quote, kick people in the knee and then stand back and watch how they responded clinically. So he had this tendency early on to what I would call what do they call that personality disorder? Sociopath. Yeah, yeah, that works. <laughs> um, he, his father was a railroad bull. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah, they, their job was to, with violence, throw people off the train who didn't belong in there. So he came home often with blood on his clothes. Now, does that suggest maybe he? willing to be violent with his son as well. I don't know. His mother died when he was five years old from throat cancer, and some people have suggested that that's adequate to send a five-year-old boy's psyche into a tailspin. Um, he was raised in a uh, pretty much just a, a, um, a very mild Methodist upbringing. And then it was between this, his graduation from high school and he was waiting until he turned 18, and he went to a uh, to, to enter West Point, and he went to a revival meeting at that Methodist church, and was saved as he puts it, and dropped all the plans and, and enrolled at Bob Jones University, and that's where apparently it all began. The really extreme Calvinist. He ended up actually kicked out of Bob Jones. <laughs> <laughs> They said if you don't, they told him if you don't get psychological help, then we're not going to, you can't stay here. And so he left and he went up to Calgary about, or to Canada about an hour and a half from where I live now, to the Prairie Bible Institute, which was um, even more tolerant of his extremism. And uh, yeah, and from there, he started preaching what he was preaching, or preached for 60 years. Yes, ma'am. never touched any of the uh, kids of other families. There were only two other families that were, were there when I was growing up. Um, but they knew what was going on and they condoned it. Um, it's not likely that, I mean, off and on people would show up, families would show up, and, and uh, I remember the old man joking about it. He would, 
when they, if someone new came from the door, he would, he would very, um, you know, he knew what he was doing. He would take his sermon that he had planned and he would, you know, jog it all together and then he would put it down here and hold it. And then he'd pull out the sermon that he had reserved for new, new, new people. And that was his hellfire and brimstone of God don't want you, we don't want you kind of sermon. And that typically drove away, they never came back, right? Uh, and those who did stay a little bit longer, once they discovered he was doing that, um, left. So generally, it, it took the weaker temperaments, those are the ones who stayed uh, long term and tolerated what he was doing. Okay, we have time for one more question, Santa. So, with regard to your documentary, are donations to the making of your documentary considered to be tax deductible? Uh, they will be tax deductible, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> There's a GoFundMe site already set up, correct? That's that is right. tax deductible. It goes through KCAC. That's right. Right. Okay. So you yeah. can search for Go. GoFundMe slash Nate Phelps, I think. Yes. Another creative title. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you.